For the second time in four months, a Chinese aircraft carrier was spotted in waters close to Guam. The Shandong and four other Chinese warships were reportedly training to encircle Taiwan in what Washington fears is a prelude to an invasion of the island that Beijing claims as a renegade province. Joint Region Marianas confirms it was tracking the Chinese ships and in a statement said, quote, The military here remains keenly postured to defend United States equities and interests in the region from any adversary that may threaten national and international norms and rules-based order. So just how serious is the threat to Taiwan? What might the U.S. response be? And most importantly, what can and should Guam do as the tensions escalate? Coming up next, we'll talk to Drs. Robert Underwood and Ken Gofigan Cooper of the Pacific Center for Island Security. And hop day, everyone, and welcome to The Hub. I'm Nestor Lecanto, and pleased to welcome our guests this week, uh, Dr. Robert Underwood and Dr. Kenneth Gofigan Cooper with the Pacific Center for Island Security, which is, I guess, a kind of a nonprofit, non government uh, organization, uh, think tank that uh, um, monitors geopolitical and military uh, issues. Uh, with, from a Guam perspective. I hope I got that right, gentlemen. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> Dr. Underwood, let me start with you because um, the, uh, the PCIS, uh, your organization, uh, recently um, put out an op-ed piece in one of the local newspapers um, about um, the uh, U.S.-China tensions over Taiwan. And I'm wondering if uh, you could just uh, start us off by just kind of summarizing some of the main points of of that op-ed piece? Uh, well, basically, we're trying to draw attention to the fact that uh, Guam is at the center of uh, all of these war gaming scenarios. I, I, I went to the uh, Center, for, uh, uh, center for International uh, Security in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, they gave me a little bit of briefing. And in 24 different scenarios involving over any potential conflict over Taiwan, Guam is attacked in all of them. And so the question becomes in in that sense is, uh, what should the people of Guam feel? What should the island, what should this part of the world feel in response to that? Do we then uh, kind of go into a fight mode, a warrior mode, uh, in which we argue for uh, more military uh, presence or more military assets or under some kind of uh, scenario thinking that uh, uh, the, the uh, increased uh, uh, so-called defensive um, uh, weapons like uh, anti-missile defense are actually going to be sent here to uh, protect us as opposed to protecting uh, the military assets that uh, are here now and uh, will be uh, in the future. It's really hard because people automatically uh, feel like they're being threatened when in reality we have to kind of look at a broader issue here. What should Guam's uh, role be in all of this? Should we uh, come out and say, you know what, maybe uh, maybe we ought to think twice about uh, automatically or reflexively uh, supporting any increase in uh, in uh, military hardware and in in, uh, in the military posture? That's that's difficult to say in an environment like Guam because uh, you know so much of our life is centered around. Uh, the military and has historically been. And so it's very difficult to get that kind of uh, uh, reflective thinking. So uh, for us, uh, we're a nonprofit, but we hope to be profitable, have profitable ideas, which is that basically uh, what if, if you if you had all the power in the world and you were running Guam, what would Guam's uh, best posture uh, be in this is to be kind of part of this uh, drive. Now, you know, when you look at it in the broader picture, uh, when you look at the broader picture of international relations uh, since the end of World War II, most of these conflicts that uh, that have occurred in the area have been conflicts between uh, kind of surrogates. You know, the Vietnam conflict, to some extent, uh, the Korean conflict was uh, supposedly a conflict between the Soviet Union and, and the United States, and they were uh, fighting on the Korean Peninsula. But in this instance, what we're facing with is the prospect of actual uh, China-U.S. Uh, conflict. And what does that mean for us? Are we just supposed to be, uh, well, 
we're just supposed to be the doormat for this and uh, and they're going to fight here and uh, just get used to it and uh, deal with it. Uh, I think there has to be something a little bit more than that. I think there has to be a voice uh, that says in us, no, we don't reflexively support everything. We do remember some of the lessons of the past. We remember the lessons of how Guam was left uh, undefended uh, in the run-up to uh, World War II. Uh, we also remember the uh, the kind of conversation that was rampant in the run-up to the Vietnam War, where there was a lot of uh, talk about the domino theory. If South Vietnam falls, the whole area will fall. Well, that hasn't happened, and I don't know what fall means anymore in the context of Vietnam. And of course, there's the weapons of mass destruction, which led to a whole other series of conflicts, which turned out to be sort of, uh, well, in a, and not just inaccurate, it was false. It was deliberately ginned up. So one, what is what is at stake in this potential conflict? And are we just uh, being uh, uh, led uh, down the, the path of, 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 of uh, kind of like a get into a warrior mode? That's, yeah, that's... Dr. Cooper, let me ask you um, uh, for your thoughts on this as well. Um, one of the more recent, uh, um, I don't know if it's a provocation or not, you would consider it a provocation, but the Chinese uh, aircraft carrier, the Shandong, has appeared um, within 400 uh, miles, apparently, of Guam's coastline for the second time in four months. How how real is the threat, and, and does that kind of bring it home, knowing the fact that there is uh, an aircraft uh, carrier, along with the several other uh, Chinese warships, um, in within our uh, you know uh, territorial waters, so to speak. Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't, I don't think it's uh well, threatening. It depends on the perspective, right? Everyone's going to have different perspective. I don't want to say it's necessarily threatening, but it is a signal, right? It is a signal that as the U.S. continues to you know run drills in the Taiwan Strait, you know the Chinese are not going to just um, sit back and take that, right? They're trying to show that they can operate beyond the first island chain, right? And they're trying to show that their their aircraft carrier, the Shandong, right? They also had the Liaoning in, uh, I believe, December, right? So yeah. there, there is signaling involved here, and they're trying to show that their aircraft carriers have reached at least these two full operational capability, right? So what do we do about that, right? And I think, you know, there what, what Dr. Underwood is speaking to is this reflexivity to say, you know what? They've done drills. This calls for further escalation. But you know, there is the, there is such thing as a security dilemma, right? As one state arms, the other state says, "Oh no, they're getting arms. We better arm up." And then the other state goes, "Oh no, they have arms again. We better." And get it just more escalates. Arms. It just yeah. escalates, right? And so we have to understand both China's role and the United States' role in this. And that's why one of the points that we make in the piece, uh, War Gaming Guam, is you know where is diplomacy? Right. It is part of American statecraft. Diplomacy is the core component of American statecraft. And yet what we're seeing is this sort of really militarized foreign policy towards the region. And we're not only seeing it in the United States. We also see uh, China, right, doing this. They're saber rattling, is, is what we call it in the piece, between China and the United States. And here we are in the middle, right, where, um, you know, as they say, I, I always like to say this, but it's uh, based off of an African proverb, when two elephants fight, right, it's the grass that gets stomped on. And unfortunately, our positionality in Guam mm -hmm. is the grass. And so when we look at, um, you know, the Shandong, I think one thing that we can definitely see is that the Chinese are signaling that they 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 will have capabilities or they, they're going to aspire to continue to gain capabilities beyond the first island chain. And, you know, Guam is the center of the second island chain. Guam is a hub of power projection, right? It's a hub of logistics. Guam is also a place to um, show your allies like Japan and South Korea that we are credible, we are near. And so Guam is a vital piece in that. Um, the other thing that I will say, you know, in addition to what Dr. Underwood was mentioning, you know, we, we have these war games and in each of them targeting Guam is a constant, but Guam isn't the center of the analyses, right? And I think that's why, you know, Dr. <laughs> Underwood went to DC and he was able to speak to the people collateral these war games. <laughs> right, right. And so it's like, you don't have to be the center to, to, to be completely damaged. And that's our problem, you know? I mean, um, we are the center of fallout. We are the center of operations, but we're not the center of conflict. We are not the ones causing the conflict, but yet we're getting centered as like the fallout place, right? And that's that's a problem. So 
you know, I think the conversation of our Chinese moves threatening need to be also be complemented with our U.S. preparations in Guam also threatening, right? It needs to be a, yeah. All right, uh, we take we got to take a quick break, yeah, but we'll be back because I want to ask you about um, just how real the threat of war is in, in your mind. We'll be right back. Okay. Okay, we are back, and uh, Dr. Underwood, uh, as I mentioned before the break, um, you know, um, Dr. Cooper mentioned saber, saber rattling, and, um, you know, it appears to me, at least, that um, Beijing is kind of just signaling outright, say, you know, I'm, we're going to do this in 2027, we're going to, and even U.S. generals and admirals are saying, that's what they're saying, that they're going to invade Taiwan in 2027, almost daring the United States say, what are you going to do about it? Um, how real is, do you think, this the likelihood of war is? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the war, a war over Taiwan, a conflict over Taiwan is a possibility. But the whole notion of how does that play out in American policy and international policy is a slightly different issue. Now, I love and respect the people of Taiwan, and I've been to Taiwan several times, but, but Taiwan is recognized by the U.S. as being part of China. And in fact, most of the world recognizes it as being part of China. What uh, mo meant much of the world is, you know, that China will not take it by force. But here we have now, you have uh, people signaling that they are for a more independent Taiwan or a Taiwan that is kind of a breakaway uh, province from uh, China, which is a very different, although looks like analogous to Ukraine. Ukraine has always been a separate country and was invaded by uh, a country, even though they had a relationship in the past, and even though they were part of the Soviet Union. The Taiwan-China uh, uh, analogy uh, doesn't hold up. But here in Guam, we're so easily... Uh, 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 you know, we, we just feel automatically tense. And, and you know, the, the uh, tension... I remember when Kim Jong-un tested one of his uh, missiles, and school was actually uh, called off in Guam as if we were really under the gun. And I'm just wondering, who who gives us this information? Why do they give us this information? And of course, it was never going to happen. And so now we're in the midst of this whole kind of series of looking like provocations. But the provocations go both ways. And the responsible kind of statecraft thing is that you're hoping that somebody uh, will step step up and try to figure out a way out of this. Now, inside the U.S., everything is China, China, China. China everything is uh, in uh, TikTok. Uh, Chinese, uh, every, every little bit of attention that you can draw to China as a potential adversary is being uh, heightened. Uh, the same thing in China. So, you know, it's just like there has to be some cooler heads prevailing in this because you don't want a Pacific war conflagration over uh, over who, whether Taiwan should be part of China or not. That train left the station a long time ago. So the question is, what is our role in that? What is Guam's role? What? How should we feel? And should we automatically fall for this? Now, the, the missile defense uh, argument is being extended widely. And uh, I have to say, there's a lot of missile defense advocates out there, contractors that are going to make a lot of money. And so they're out there kind of ginning this up a lot. And, we're, and, and it's not really even a proven system. So we have to have some conversation about whether that's really going to work or not, whether we can really have that level of protection. And what does it mean when you get 19 missile batteries on Guam. Is that going to make us more secure or more of a target? All right, I want to get more uh, more into the missile defense um, issue a little bit later, but uh, let me ask you, uh, Dr. Ken, um, I think uh, Dr. Under raised the possibility or the potential of another uh, outcome if um, China were to invade Taiwan and that the Americans may um, not want to go in, get into a shooting war, 
Uh, they might want to maybe supply arms uh, to the Taiwanese as they have done with uh, Ukraine. So that's uh, another uh, possibility that might happen if, in fact, uh, Beijing does uh, start an, a, an attack on Taiwan? I mean, I, it, it does seem, it does seem like if um, Taiwan is going to be amphibiously invaded by China that um, you know, it seems like military involvement past just supplying arms may be more possible than, than we think. And I think that's a cause of concern. And I think this is where the balance has to come from, right? It has to be, we cannot be fearing all the time and let that drive policy, as Dr. Underwood mentions. And at the same time, you know, it, it isn't a matter of, um, how do we say this? We can't just be fear-mongering all the time, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that the threat exists and that will the proposed shields for Guam necessarily be effective? So it, it, it's an odd it's an odd middle ground, right? So if we talk about where Guam's role is in a potential conflict, if, if it gets that kinetic, right, it's like we can't say, okay, this means we're going to give a green light for everything that the United States wants to do to defend Guam. Uh, but on the other token, if we do accept that, well, how effective are these systems? Um, what role does Guam have to prevent? So this is something that's always uh, that's always very interesting. I uh, hope you don't, Dr. Ronder, you don't mind me mentioning uh, a conversation that you had recently. But uh, was Dr. Underwood did meet with one individual, we'll name unnamed, out in D.C., and they said, uh, they said, don't worry. I, if they attack one part of the island, the other part of the island will be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's not that just doesn't work for Guam, right? Yeah. If yeah. a missile yeah. yeah. reaches the yeah. north of sure. Guam, our psyche's ruined. Like we're going to be, so, you know. Yeah, that so will be a little devastated. little consolation. <laughs> yeah. It will be a little you know, we consolation. Gotta, we got to take another half. quick break, uh, and we'll be back to talk more about this uh, in, in just a moment. Please stay with us. Okay. Uh, before the break, we were talking about you know the implications uh, sh or, or the different scenarios. Should there be a, an attack uh, uh, on Taiwan by the, the, the by Beijing? Uh, but Dr. Underwood, uh, what can Guam do, and what should Guam do in in your mind? Uh, well, uh, Guam has to take us. Uh, in my mind, Guam has to take a, a, a not necessarily a middle ground stand but a stance that says, you know, we're more than just the tip of the spear, and we're certainly more than just a target. And those are the only two roles that we have. Because we are the tip of the spear, we are a target. And now, what, what other roles can we play in this part of the world? We have, uh, you know, we have people-to-people -people relationships with other parts of the world. But more importantly, what should the people of Guam say, you know? We, we are not just, as Ken pointed out, just collateral damage. That's how military planners think. They say, oh, when I ask the question, do you think that the Chinese will uh, target the, uh, uh, the, the power grid in Guam? They, <laughs> the planners told me, no, don't worry about that. They're not interested in making your life miserable. They're just interested in knocking out all the military assets as if, as if, well, I'm just supposed to be comforted by that. And, you know, they could use uh, nuclear weapons and you could survive a, a tactical nuclear weapons strike. And, and that's how people think when yeah. they're at that level. And, you know, I, I think we ought to wise up to the fact that, that war planners think that way. Not not because they're uh, they're they're doing things that are out of line, but that's what they're trained to do. They're trained to uh, make assessments about that. So what we should say is, hold on there, hold on there. We want to know what is our the, our best interest. What is the best interest of the region? How can we avoid being the ground for another? a worldwide conflict as we were in World War II or a handmaiden to conflicts in this part of the world that don't turn out too, too well. Yeah, and, and Dr. Ken, it, it would appear at this point that we're kind of like um, 
literally um, sitting ducks. And we talked <laughs> a little, we mentioned earlier about the missile defense system. Um, what are your thoughts on how um, the military is currently going about um, trying to build this missile defense system to protect us against um, all of these um, potentially incoming from um, from, Be from the Beijing attack? Well, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, well, number one, the the Hudson Institute had this whole forum called Defending Guam, and you know, one thing that was one thing that was very clear was that they don't think it's possible to actually develop a three hundred sixty degree uh, missile defense proposal missile defense system that will have zero leak capability, right? So there are expectations of missiles leaking through the system, right? Is what they call it. And so, you know, the thing about this is this has been even from the Missile Defense Agency themselves, as well as some other federal government agencies have said that a lot of this is going to be experimental and that the lessons learned in Guam will be used to protect other parts of the homeland like California. <laughs> right? So right. this is, you know, this is the this is the experimentation <laughs> phase here in Guam. Right. And so, you know, I, I don't think that we, the people of Guam, can put 100 percent trust into the missile defense proposals that were being that are being uh you know, pretty much disseminated throughout the community. I think that we need to be a little bit more critical and ask, you know, what are what exactly are the components? Give you an example. They were supposed to have, uh, as part of the NDAA, they were supposed to have the who's going to be uh, conducting the independent study. The deadline passed, right? The deadline passed, and I believe Congressman Moynan reached out to Secretary of Defense Austin, and they said, "Oh, you know, we'll we'll have it eventually." But so, you know, like how serious of this is a priority? Um, on their end, and how much will it work, and how will domestic American politics um, stall this or push it forward? Um, but you know, the other thing that we also have to keep in mind is important when you talk about a sitting ducks and the military's uh, shift. Is the the Air Force used to have continuous bomber presence here? Now they shifted to agile combat employment, and all of this reflects this distributed and dispersed architecture that we we, we really study at PCIS. The idea is to make yourself less predictable so that you disperse assets throughout different islands, right? And we can start seeing that. So, but while doing this, you're also dispersing the risk. But while in understanding this, it means that Guam isn't the safest place in the world, right? And I think, and they acknowledge that they need to move and disperse things throughout the other islands because Guam can be a sitting duck, right? So that's our positionality. How we respond to that positionality and our place in the world I think it's really a matter uh, of one of the greatest challenges of our time, because if this happens, Guam is a target. Plain and, yeah. and, and, um, and just, to, just to add to that, it, it is important that we have a sober conversation about this uh, locally, which we haven't had. So it's not just reflexively being critical of everything the military does, but to understand the logic that they're giving and saying, is this really uh, is this really accurate? Is this or is this some uh, some kind of uh, gambit that we're not sure of? But uh, so so when you throw in missile defense, which means lots and lots of money spent on on huge contractors, you can expect that there's going to be robust conversations and media releases in favor of missile defense, but maybe not so many that are critical. Yeah, and just really quickly. The when we say missile defense, this is also a system, as I understand it, that could potentially be used as an offensive weapon. Is that correct? Well, I know, didn't, I think it was in a news story that they were trying to find more funding for offensive capabilities, right? Wasn't that, wasn't that said? I'm, I'm not too yeah. sure on what offensive capabilities okay. they want to put in Guam, but that would be, to my mind, that would be a huge mistake. Yeah. All right. We got to take another quick break and we'll be back to wrap it up with the original question. Don't go away, anybody. Okay, we've got about uh, three or four minutes left, and I want to go circle back to um, what we had just talked about at the top. And, and you know, sometimes there's a very fine line between uh, reporting for us journalists reporting on the realities of what's going on and not being overly alarmist. Um, so I wanted to ask each of you just to give us uh, your quick sense of how dangerous is this really uh, for us uh, right now and, and in the in the months ahead, Dr. Underwood. 
Okay, well, we do live in a dangerous part of the world, and but uh, you know our 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 responsible positioning is not uh, how to just respond to that danger, but how to reduce that danger, how to reduce the possibility of uh, conflict, which will be to no one's particular benefit. Uh, so that's uh, I I don't think we are in imminent danger. I when people start giving deadlines like uh, you know by. Uh, and this is from the U.S. side. By 2025, uh, we'll be at war with China, or there'll be a conflict over Taiwan. Uh, th that kind of irresponsible rhetoric, uh, really. Uh, uh, and then it's reported, but uh, you know, uh, is is not helpful. And it doesn't it doesn't contribute. Certainly doesn't contribute to our, our true security. So our true security is what we're looking for. Is trying to figure out. What actually can make our uh, our island safe for future generation? All right, and Dr. Ken, got about a minute left, and we'll wrap it up with you. Your thoughts? Uh, I, I tend to agree. I think we are in a very dangerous part of the world. I think the way that um, we have been pretty much sharpened. You know, we're called the tip of the spear. We're being sharpened today in 2023, and that can have very dangerous ramifications for Guam. Um, you know, we are sitting at the center of the second island chain, so we have to take this seriously. But we have to we have to understand that I think diplomacy is a way out of it. And what can we do in Guam to sort of bring a more diplomatic approach? How do we reach out to federal officials? How do we start the conversation here? Um, I think that's critically important. I wouldn't underestimate the threat in the sense that it does exist, but I would say that we need more creative solutions that are more diplomatic and do not guarantee that Guam is just thrown in um, as the grass in which the elephants fight. Yeah, I wish we had more time, but we are out of it. Uh, Dr. Thank Robert you. Underwood and Dr. Kenneth Gofigan Cooper of the Pacific Center for Island Security, thank you so much for your insight. Thanks for, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Nestor Canto. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you again next week on The Hub.